Hey everyone, it's Denise Brown from the Caregiving Years Training Academy. Thanks so much for being here. I am surrounded by amazing advocates in the family caregiver space who have signed on to help us create awareness around a really unique opportunities for family caregivers. In the American Rescue Plan Act, which was signed into law in March by President Biden, there actually is an opportunity for states to receive enhanced federal funding that they can use in their Medicaid services, which are community, home and community-based services. And it's an opportunity for them to help family caregivers. In that actual, I guess, guidance that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have offered includes support for family caregivers. So we've created three recommendations to help the states quickly add in support for family caregivers in their plans that they are creating right now. And in order to do that, we're getting together, we're supporting the recommendations, and we're reaching out to our state Medicaid offices, to our representatives, to our Department on Aging offices, and to our behavioral health offices. I just finished emailing our 50 state Medicaid directors. So it is possible to make a difference. And so I wanna introduce you to the advocates who are joining me today. So let's start with Deb Hallisey. Hi, Deb. Hey, Denise. Thank Deb you. Is, Deb is a certified uh, caregiving consultant and she is here to represent our coalition of CCCs. So thanks for being here, Deb. Thanks for asking me. And it's an honor to, to represent our coalition of certified caregiving consultants. You know, this means so much to me because I just run across when I work with families all the times, issues that come up, respite comes up, um, you know, the fact that they are paying their own money and they're not getting compensated for what they're doing. And the fact that they are so stressed and they have no one to talk to. Um, it just comes up over and over and over again when you work with family caregivers. And, and you know what, that's even just the tip of the iceberg is really what it gets down to but it's an incredible place to start because these are the things that, that they talk about. And so it's such an honor to represent a coalition of, of uh, people who work with family caregivers, help them find resources, and just are able to listen to them. Um, you know, it's so funny to me, I'm so excited to be working with you um, because advocacy for families has been a part of my life forever. Um, you know, I actually have a background in home economics, which is really the study of the family. And so family dynamics, what they need has been always a passion. And then you add on top of that, the fact that when I was in graduate school, I did an internship on Capitol Hill, actually advocating for um, laws that help families. And I just feel like years later, this is where I'm meant to be and really push this forward. So thank you for that. Okay. So Kathy and Alyssa, let's do you both at the same time. Kathy Sikorsky is actually a volunteer who's been helping me generally with advocacy issues. And she's actually on the uh, board of directors for a respite program that's based in the Philadelphia area called Nancy's House. And the executive director, Alyssa is here with us today. And Nancy's House is one of the supporting organizations. And I should mention that our three recommendations are compensate family caregivers, provide counseling for family caregivers, and provide respite for family caregivers. So Kathy and Alyssa, why is it important for you to sign on and endorse these recommendations and push them out so that they actually get, become part of the state plan? I'm, go I'm gonna let Alyssa do the bulk of this because she is definitely the heart and soul of Nancy's house and has been for 12, or 15 years, a long time, I know that. And um, I just admire everything about her and what she's done with this. And I'm so proud to be uh, the co-president of the board of Nancy's House. But as an elder attorney, and as someone who has been a caregiver for eight different family members and friends over the last 30 years, I want you to know that nobody understands this more from a legal and a practical space than I do. And the fact that we are even able to have this conversation today, where we are really talking about 
federal policy to financially assist caregivers um, who have been so burdened for so long as unpaid family caregivers uh, just is beyond exciting to me because my mission now personally is to educate people, especially women, about the legal and financial pitfalls of caregiving. And if I can say, you know, there used to be a lot more pitfalls and we are actually making this better for you every single day. And this is how we can do it. I couldn't be happier. And to be a part of Nancy's house, which steps in and does the counseling and respite part of this, just thrills me beyond belief. So I'm so thrilled to be a part of this and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, extend policy. And now I'll let Alyssa tell you about the beauty that is Nancy's house. I don't know how to follow that up, Kathy. Oh my goodness. Um, so Nancy's House um, was incorporated in 2006. We've been running programs for family caregivers since 2009. We actually bring caregivers to us in small groups to step out of their caregiving roles, give them a little bit of pampering, a little bit of nurturing, but more importantly, to build a community of support and to teach them self-care skills. And in the... I'm doing the math, oh my God, 11 years, 12 years that we have been running programs. Um, I think that what we hear consistently and what we see consistently is how exhausted caregivers are, how few resources are there, the financial stresses because they have had to stop working or reduce their work. And so the idea of being able to get paid for doing this service that comes from the heart, but we all know what that really means, right, um, is pretty phenomenal. And to provide counseling to, for guests who come and say, being able to talk about this with somebody else who really understands and just knowing what that does for them, um, we have to support this. We have to make this available to all caregivers. And I think that the pandemic that we have been coming through has highlighted all of the needs that we really have to support our caregivers. This has been an extra stressful time and has really highlighted how much support we have to provide so that they can continue to be the backbone of our healthcare system. Okay, and let me introduce you to Ali. He was one of the first individuals that I contacted and he was one of the first to sign on his company to endorse these recommendations. And Ali is the CEO of T-Care, which is a platform that assesses family caregivers' needs and it's a platform that's used by state Medicaid agencies, by employers, by insurance companies, and by area agencies on aging. So Ali, when you got my email and you saw the recommendations, why was it important for you to be a part of this and sign on as a sponsor? Yeah, thank you, Denise, uh, for having me. Uh, yeah, so uh, just to just to reiterate, uh, CEO of T-Care, think of our platform as the operating system that helps organizations manage their caregiver uh, platforms. We're not, our, our software is never used by the caregiver. It sits on the back end and, and is a data analytics platform. So um, I, I'm gonna talk uh, about this maybe a little more dry and uh, a little less, uh, uh, I guess, subjective and more regarding the data. What we have seen is, uh, in, in, in our data uh, across the 38 states that we are now deployed in, in either Medicaid 1115 or 1915 programs or some other Medicare uh, programs, what we see is that uh, when respite is provided to caregivers, we, we see a significant drop specifically in stress and depression levels um, that, that our system is, is gathering. Now, depending on what happens after that, we see that spike come back up or uh, 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 stay, stay down in, that, in those uh, uh, reduced levels. Um, but also in states that have self-directed and consumer-directed programs where caregivers are paid uh, for some of the hours, uh, even though some of them are very limited, uh, in those areas, we, we also see the general stress levels of caregivers be reduced. Now, we, we extrapolate this uh, across 72 chronic disease conditions and, and, and have that across 94 different data attributes um, and, and compare and contrast these. And, and we see generally uh, the stress is, is much lower. So uh, 
what, what we are essentially advocating for and, and supporting here is the recommendations of not only respite and, and, and paid programs, but one of the most um, forgotten areas of the healthcare system is counseling and, and helping that caregiver cope with the duties that they're facing. At T-Care, we call it identity discrepancy. It's the transition of identity from a son, daughter, spouse role into a caregiver role. That identity shift that goes back and forth, uh, that counseling piece is extremely important. And we see that uh, not only tied to reduced, let's say subjective stress and depression levels, but we tie that directly to med state Medicaid dollars. So, so we're able to tie reduced stress and depression, uh, reduced stress and depression levels down on exactly how that's Im impacting different states dollars. So uh, with that, we're glad to be supportive of this initiative. I think that's awesome because we have the stories and we have the data and there's nothing that's more compelling than when you put both together. And it was interesting, Ali and I had connected, I think it was in the fall, it feels like yesterday, but I guess it was probably about six months ago. And you were sharing data that was fresh from what the experience of family caregivers was during the pandemic. So I love that what you're able to do is really give this snapshot of right now, this is what the family caregiver is experiencing. And to know that right now, this is what helps them is even more critical. So it's amazing how our recommendations aligned with what you know, that's awesome. So Bruce, let's go to you. So Bruce is a colleague and a friend. He is the executive director of Parkinson Foundation of Oklahoma. Hi Bruce, thanks for being here. Hi. Yeah, glad to be here. Um, so my, my interest here is that uh, we moved back to Oklahoma City in 2006 because I was a caregiver uh, of my wife and still am uh, almost 17 years later, well, from her original diagnosis. And, uh, and I wound up running a program for caregivers called the Caregiver Fundamentals Project through a larger nonprofit. It was a federal grant program. And our program actually employed some part-time respite workers that, but the recipients could get up to four hours per week. So not a whole lot, but just a little bit of a breather. And also that program at the time, uh, 06 to 08, provided eight hours total of counseling for caregivers for a, up, up to a limited amount. Um, yeah. That's the lowest paid job I've ever had in my life, but I really enjoyed uh, running that program. Uh, I had a part-time gig that paid more than my full-time job. Uh, but over the years, I've known every person that ever ran that program since me, and we've, I've always stayed in touch with the program here in Oklahoma City. And slowly but surely, the respite has remained, but the counseling went away over time. And, um, but while I don't recall the objective numbers and the quantitative numbers, uh, I do remember the qualitative is that the people that took advantage of that, it absolutely helped them. You have to have help to get through at a consult, better ideas, better strategies. And so now uh, with the Parkinson Foundation of Oklahoma, which I've been volunteering on the board, uh, the director for six and a half years now, these three things we see all the time. People ask the question, is there any way, you know, I can't do all of my work. Is there any way I could get some funding or some help to do what I need to do? Um, the number of people who can pay to have respite come in their home is small uh, compared to the people who can easily afford that. Uh, the, the need is incredible of people who at least just need a break. And there are some programs, but the expansion of those just has to happen. And, you know, talking to folks one on one, I mean, everyone is at their wits end after years of caregiving, uh, not only due to the physical burden and difficulties, but also to the cognitive challenges. And sometimes the cognitive is more challenging than the physical. Um, and so uh, to have a consult, to have some coaching, to have some counseling, uh, towards better practices is just essential. So all three, we're all in. We see it every day. I should mention that Bruce was our keynote at our National Caregiving Conference that I used to host, as was Kathy Sikorsky. They both were keynotes. And Bruce was actually one of our Caregiving Visionary Award winners. And that was in 2019. 
18. <laughs> it's 18. Been a while. <laughs> okay, so let's go to Kara, because you know what? Actually, Bruce, you gave a nice lead into Kara, because she's been a family caregiver for more than 20 years. So most of her adult life has been caring for her mother and now her grandmother. And she has been a great volunteer and a great advocate for me. So the recommendation form that we created, that two pager, she did the graphic design and she beefed up the headlines to really tie it to a crisis. So we had recommendations and then she tied it to the reason why these recommendations are so important. So Kara, why is it important for you to volunteer to help with something like this? You've got such a busy day <laughs> and yet you make time for this. This is very important to me um, personally. Um, as you mentioned, I've been um, a, a caregiver to first my mother and then my grandmother for almost my entire adult life. I've never known parenting without caregiving or caregiving without parenting. It's always coincided to me. And then one day I was reading an article and there's a very famous quote that um, the greatest thing you can have in aging is a daughter. And I have two daughters. And I said, no, not like this. <laughs> I refuse to let my two daughters, um, if they are ever put into the situation, I refuse to let it um, be like it is now without the support services, without the mental health help, without the, the respite care, without compensation. Um, I, I just can't let that happen to them and, and to all the other sons and daughters who might be put in that position. So um, I could either sit here and, and him and haul about it or, or I could do something about it. And I have um, a background in marketing and communications at the University of Virginia. It's my full-time job. So I wanted to put my skill set um, to use um, for the greater good. So that's why I'm here and I'm happy to be here. So thanks for bringing me into the group, Denise. I should mention that we've known each other for years through mm -hmm. social media, but we just connected live, so to speak, within the past, I would say six weeks or so. Yeah. I've never mm -hmm. laughed so hard than when, I, <laughs> <laughs> than when I've spent a Friday afternoon talking to Kara. It's really been great. You are my respite. You are my oh, respite. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Sean, she also was one of our Caregiving Visionary Award winners when we did the National Caregiving Conference, and that was in 2019. Sean helps care for her husband, and she has started a nonprofit called Caregivers on the Home Front, which supports military family caregivers. So, Sean, it's so great to have your support on this initiative. Tell us why it's important to you. Oh, boy. So thank you first um, for having us on board. You know, so there are about 5.5 million, approximately 5.5 million military and veteran caregivers. And there are only 23,000 of them in the VA caregiver program. Isn't that crazy? Um, so it's a very low number. Now, I happen to be one of those caregivers in the VA caregiver program, which allows me to receive respite. It allows me to receive mental health care as well as compensation. So what better to talk to someone that is getting those things um, than, than those that aren't, but our organization, Caregivers on the Home Front, supports so many of the caregivers taking care of our wounded and ill veterans that do not receive any of those services through the VA. In fact, uh, the RAND Corporation did a study and military and veteran caregivers have a higher rate of depression than their civilian counterparts. It's about 20 some percent. So I care for my husband who was in the military for 23 years and most of his injuries are um, mental. And um, which I always say, our veterans, as well as your loved ones, do not heal or recover in a vacuum. They heal around their families. And if we're not doing things such as mental health care, such as respite, they are not healing and getting a good quality of life when their family is not able to receive these services. I happen to be a licensed mental uh, um, licensed master social worker. So when you talk counseling, that that is uh, 
speaking to my heart and soul. And I know how, how important it is for our caregivers to receive this mental health counseling. We happen to have a grant um, that supports the mental health and wellness of our caregivers that we support so that they can come to us for free mental health care. Because even with, even with insurance, those co-pays are way expensive. So much so that if the main caregiver is needing mental health care and then the children are, those co-pays can be really expensive and they can't, then they can't afford it. So for me personally, having um, to care for a loved one with PTSD, suicidality, several suicide attempts, and then we have a 10 year old at home, the mental health of our family would not be as well if I did not have access to some of the key things that we are advocating for. And, and I'm 23,000 out of 5.5 million. That's a really low number to be receiving respite care and mental health care and compensation. So I, I am here to represent every single 5.5 million military and veteran caregivers in this I mean, absolutely important work. It has to be done. If the dollars are there, let's step up. We know that COVID has brought on even more caregivers and those caregivers that we did have and do have are experiencing more of a burden, burnout. It's just absolutely important that we do this. Something I should mention is that you are meeting part of our informal coalition and there's another video where you're going to meet the rest of them. So this is only part of the amazing individuals and organizations that have signed on to support our recommendations. And again, our recommendations are for states to use the enhanced federal funding that's available to them because of the American Rescue Plan Act. We are recommending that states use that additional money to pay family caregivers to provide counseling and to provide respite so that they can get a break. We know that a family caregiver needs more than that, but we wanted to start with three recommendations with hopes that a state sees those and says, let's do it. This is easy, we can do it. So we would love your help getting the, work, the word out. You can go to careyearsacademy.com slash funding You'll see the list of organizations so you can contact them if you'd like to know more. And you'll also have access to our toolkit and our toolkit includes contact information for representatives, your state Medicaid directors, your aging uh, state directors and mental health directors for your states. In addition, you can um, find posts for social media and then an entire email the message for an email that you can send to your state Medicaid director. I just did it. I sent emails to 50. It took me about, I was trying to pay attention to time, it took me a little over an hour. So you could spend just 10 minutes of your time just contacting those individuals in your state. And when you do that, you actually are speaking for all family caregivers in your state and you never know what a difference that will make. Okay, thanks everybody so much for being here. Thanks for all your help and support. Great to see you all and we'll keep you posted. Thanks everyone, take care, bye-bye.